Actually, what we do a lot uh, within this THINK report is to think about possible harmonization for a need for EU instruments and for a need for a specific regulation for certain issues. But uh, do we also need a particular EU policy for electricity storage? Um, this was actually the question of one of our last uh, THINK reports where we investigated electricity storage and uh, how to facilitate its deployment and operation in the EU. The project leader was uh, Georges Vasconcelos and uh, part of the research team was also, for instance, Xian, who is sitting also here in the audience and uh, some other people. <coughs> The uh, New World European uh, power system sees a lot of changes recently, so we have changes on both the supply and uh, demand side. You are all very well aware of these facts. We talk here about uh, the connection of uh, large-scale renewables, about an increasing importance of distributed generation, and so about a lot of intermittency and variability of supply. We also talk about an increasing system interconnection and interdependence and the trend towards uh, smart grids and uh, an increasing penetration of electric vehicles. But we especially also talk about an increasing interplay between the distribution and the transmission levels. So any change in the, uh, on the demand side will also have an impact on flow patterns in the transmission grid. But where could we see electricity storage in this new uh, power system? To give an easy answer, it could be more or less everywhere because it could be connected to the transmission and uh, distribution grids. It could be connected to end consumers, to renewable producers. Also thermal storage devices could um, see some interesting applications. So you see that storage could be closer to generation or closer to load. It could be operated in a more centralized way or in a more decentralized manner. And it also could be more a kind of a shared resource benefiting the entire system or more a kind of dedicated resource that really benefits one single generator or load. And what our report did was to identify this, these new drivers for this new current interest in electricity storage we see. We discussed viable business models and we also did then analyze whether the current market design and regulation do also support these different possible business models. So my presentation has three main parts. I first will say something about whether storage is actually a special class of assets for the power system. Then I will talk about the economics of storage and then I will give you a very brief and short overview on the main guidelines for market design and regulation. So what do we mean when we talk about um, electricity storage? In a very broad definition, energy storage is um, the basic energy, well, I mean the basic energy storage problem then could be understood as um, taking energy whenever and in whatever form it's available to convert it to whatever form is best uh, for storage and then to reconvert it to whichever form is best for use at the time you need it. But, so this does actually not only include pumped hydro or batteries for instance, but here you also have thermal storage devices, you have capacitors and many other technologies. But in contrast, in a more narrow definition, electric energy storage could be understood as a kind of triable. So it's able to consume electricity, to accumulate this energy, and then it's also able to reproduce electricity. But what does it mean? Where does the value come from? And value here comes first from these abilities to consume and to produce electricity. And this value is related to the response time, to the power rating, to the energy rating. And it's also related to um, the storage function itself, so to intertemporal arbitrage. And of course, it also will then depend on many other technical uh, parameters and economic parameters of the respective technologies employed. But when we started to work on this topic, we first wondered whether um, storage is really a special class of assets because there are many alternative means of flexibility on both the generation and the demand side. And um, so let's now first have a look on these alternative means uh, abilities regarding downward adjustment, accumulation and upward adjustment for storage. I already talked about that. 
for a flexible operation of generation, downward adjustment means that you just produce less electricity during a certain period of time, and upward adjustment then means that you produce more electricity, and storage here is just related to the fuel of the power plant. And for demand side management and demand response, downward adjustment implies that you pr uh, consume more electricity during a certain period. This might result from shifting demand from peak to off-peak uh, periods or from loading thermal storage devices, for instance. And then in contrast, upward adjustment means that you just consume less. And so you see summarizing that all these uh, means are able to react to the system requirements of up and downward adjustment. And they also include the opportunity to benefit from intertemporal arbitrage. And so it's rather a matter of quantity and degree. And the value will come from the match uh, between the services to be provided and the technical uh, characteristics of the possible technologies you could employ. And so electricity storage and its benefits have to be uh, assessed under a double uncertainty. There's not only this uncertainty related to um, the technical and cost evolution of storage itself, but uh, there's also uncertainty related to the evolution of uh, generation grids and demand flexibility. And so this uh, very often expressed need for electricity storage to enable the integration of renewable <coughs> energy sources is actually an economic question. And it will depend on the costs and benefits of the different alternative technologies and uh, yeah, their alternatives, basically. Um, so what are viable business models for electricity storage in the future power system? Um, electricity storage has these different functionalities I did introduce before at certain technical characteristics, of course. And there are some services which need to be provided, and they are determined by the specific stakeholder needs, by the time frame, in the sense of response time, charging, discharging time. So the question actually is not so much whether there's a business case for electricity storage, but in contrast, the real question is whether there is a business case for electricity storage to provide certain services. <coughs> And this all is, uh, of course, embedded in the market design and in the regulatory framework. And taking all this together, a potential investor will take an investment decision and an operating decision. And this then all will determine income streams. Um, the main categorization of storage technologies uh, is the one where you distinguish between those technologies that are better um, suited for energy applications, like pumped hydro or compressed air, and other technologies um, that are better suited for power applications, power quality management, like flywheels or different forms of batteries. And of course, they have then different uh, other technical uh, parameters. But um, a problematic we see today is that uh, the provision of one single service typically is not sufficient to reach cost effectiveness. This also has been shown in many studies. And so it's necessary to aggregate different services to reveal the total value that storage can provide to the system and also to improve uh, the economic performance of a storage device. And actually, as this figure shows very well, a single technology, a single storage technology also is very well able to provide multiple services. So from a technical point of view, the aggregation of services is perfectly feasible. And so um, our business model for electricity storage will involve multiple services to be provided, and it will involve multiple income streams. And so there are actually challenges related to the aggregation of these multiple services and related to the maximization of this multi-income stream. We uh, did in our report differentiate different types of storage according to the location in the power system because the location will involve different stakeholders. It will uh, determine the most plausible combinations of uh, valuable services and then it will also 
determine the combination of regulated and deregulated income streams. So, for example, if you have a look on large-scale electricity storage that is directly connected to the transmission grid, you have a situation where storage typically will be mainly used for price arbitrage, and there might also be some uh, remaining capacities that then can then be used uh, to provide system services. Whereas in contrast, for instance, for a storage that is directly connected to a renewable generator, you will mainly uh, build the storage and operate the storage to uh, reduce uh, and to optimize the capital intensive grid investments. And then there might again be some potential for the renewable generator to control flows by using the storage device and to benefit from favorable energy prices, of course, only if theoretically, if he also has the right incentives in the market. Uh, but summarizing here, you see that there's always one prevailing function in which the storage uh, will be used and some remaining capacities can then be used uh, for other services. And so we differentiated between two types of business models, a deregulated driven business model where the main <coughs> income streams come from activities in energy markets and in contrast, a regulated driven business model where the main income is generated by uh, providing services to a regulated actor. So what should be the purpose of regulatory intervention now and where could regulation play a role? Is there actually any need for EU involvement? Um, there are some market inefficiencies that might result from a lack of liquidity in energy and balancing market. And especially in balancing market, this is uh, further uh, reinforced by the presence of uh, market access barriers because you have here minimum bidding requirements, you have minimum, minimum uh, bidding durations, you have in many markets the requirement to symmetrically bid up and downward adjustments. And furthermore, there might be uh, some distortions coming from administratively <coughs> fixed price caps and floors, ad hoc peak lo load arrangements, and also the uh, persistent uh, inconsistence regarding the price fixing mechanisms in day ahead and balancing markets in, in many uh, markets, because often um, balancing energy um, is uh, not remunerated based on marginal prices. Oops, sorry. Um, so, um, one, some uh, key or some, some main recommendations we developed in our report uh, included that market rules should be modified such that the minimum bidding requirements and the rules that require symmetric up and downward bids are relaxed because this especially will also facilitate the market access for new small uh, market players which could be, for instance, a storage provider, but which also could, for instance, be an aggregator that aggregates electric vehicles or demand response uh, means. And the remuneration in these two markets, energy and balancing markets, also should be harmonized. For the provision of ancillary services, we have a wide heterogeneity regarding the procurement methods that are uh, used in different markets, but also in single markets for different services. And this might actually hamper an efficient participation of these new sources of flexibility. And it also might hamper an efficient sharing of flexibility resources over Europe. And it's also very difficult to uh, determine the value of uh, providing a certain ancillary, services, uh, ancillary service and to discover that value. And uh, in many settings, the value that storage can provide to the system theoretically might also not be adequately recognized. Like, for instance, the ability of some technologies to respond very, very quickly, much quicker than, um, than traditional means of flexibility that are used uh, today or have been used in the past. 
So I have uh, one remark at uh, the beginning, uh, namely that uh, this coexistence of several forms of procurement and remuneration actually economically does make sense. Uh, and the suitability of an option then will depend on the service targeted. So for standardized uh, services, spot market procurement is perfectly fine, whereas for a service that is very specific and uh, where, for instance, all market players or grid uh, users uh, have more or less equal benefits, uh, mandatory provision could be much better suited than, than spot market. Um, Nevertheless, one should uh, reconsider to uh, replace bilateral contracts by competitive tendering wherever this is possible because this could really help to reveal and to uh, quantify the value of different flexibility means. And one also should consider to adopt performance-based remuneration and uh, the EU also should be involved in facilitating the exchange of ancillary services across borders uh, because even though many ancillary services are quite location specific, it should not be political borders that restrict the flows of uh, ancillary services. Um, so in any case, regulation uh, should always uh, facilitate market access, it should foster market build up, it should help to establish a level playing field for storage and other uh, flexibility means. Um, but besides, there are also uh, different areas where regulation could play a role and where regulation could uh, uh, especially uh, play a role to um, also help to uh, build up a business model for electricity storage. Um, so, for instance, one issue is the business of aggregators. They are a quite new player in the market and so in many markets the access of these <coughs> players in balancing markets, for instance, is just not yet given. Um, storage could become part of the business case of a renewable generator. The uh, ownership of storage assets also is uh, an issue that is intensively debated at the moment. So in Italy, for instance, there is a recent initiative that allows the TSO, so the transmission system operator, to own and operate storage systems like battery systems to uh, support grid stability. And there's a huge discussion ongoing whether this does make sense or not, whether it might distort competition or not. And also um, an issue that is intensively debated. So, uh, for instance, Germany recently introduced um, exemptions for new storage devices from grid tariffs for a certain period of time. And so we have a situation where we have different approaches in different member states which might actually uh, distort competition. And there are also some discussions ongoing about um, the allocation of grid tariffs to storage because optimally a grid tariff should be allocated based on the principle of cost causality and this is not so obvious for electricity storage. So which role could the EU play now? Do we need this particular regulation supporting electricity storage or not? Um, actually the EU involvement today is quite limited. Uh, it mainly addresses uh, the definition of underlying principles for system operation, dispatching and balancing, and the provision of ancillary services. There are some general rules for tariff design, and of course the principle of unbundling holds. Um, for the future, we see the role of the EU mainly in ensuring well-functioning markets and efficient regulation and also in helping to remove the barriers uh, of market access and of participation in markets of these different means of flexibility, not only storage but of all alternative and new means of flexibility. And so here one should consider to, or one should work on removing the barriers for cross-border balancing markets and also remove the barriers for the participation of storage in energy markets and actually the framework guideline that has been published, um, the framework guideline on electricity balancing that has been published in uh, September, I think, um, already uh, mm, includes uh, a lot of um, 
aspects uh, on these issues. So it calls for a Euro integrated European balancing market and it also uh, argues that the network codes that are to be drafted should then facilitate the participation of demand response and aggregators in balancing markets. So actually here the right step is already done. Uh, but maybe one also could um, build some kind of good practice guidelines for ancillary service provision in the sense of also explicitly encouraging performance-based procurement methods and of course uh, a role for the EU always or for EU institutions always will be to avoid that national policies impose distortions in competition and to then if this is the case uh, have an opinion on whether it's possible heterogeneity in national approaches might be a problem and harmonization then might be needed. And that's it actually from my side. I thank you very much for your attention. Now I look forward to the comments and discussion.